The construction of race has long plied in America throughout its development. Race has acted as an ascribed social status for several different ethnic groups in America since its humble beginnings, dating back to the first meetings of indigenous population and European settlers. The arbitrary construct of race has provided real-world consequences for ethnic minorities and has resulted in a history of conflict and tragedy in America. One such tragedy occurred on February 19, 1942. The signing of Executive Order 9066 came with the inevitable mass internment of individuals of Japanese ancestry, including those granted American citizenship through the 14th Amendment. This project would seek to spotlight the Japanese American experience within these American-made internment camps. This project will focus on the camp conditions, regulations, attempts of normalcy and resistance in camp life, and an analysis on the Japanese Americans' attempts at conforming to American society and proving their Americanness. The spotlighting of camp life for Japanese Americans during their imprisonment provides a clear example of the insider-outsider dilemma that has plagued America since its beginning. Japanese Americans who were born in America, lived in America, were embedded in American culture, worked in America, and had families in America were seemingly assigned the status of an outsider overnight. However, in hindsight, we understand that this level of racial exclusion was not overnight, and anti-Japanese sentiment was prevalent all throughout the early 20th century. But the signing of Executive Order 9066 completed the shift of Americans with Japanese ancestry into the outsider group. These Japanese Americans that were fully pushed into the outsider group of American society were forced to face the crucial question, what does it mean to be truly American? Japanese American internment experience officially began on December 7, 1941 with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. According to scholar Sandra Taylor, the Pearl Harbor attack devastated the Japanese American community and sparked fears of retaliation from the already hostile U.S. public. The Japanese American Citizens League attempted to side with the U.S. by denouncing Japan for the attacks and declare their loyalty to America. Despite this declaration of loyalty, America would see a resurgence of anti-Japanese organizations of the past that would capitalize on America's fears of the Japanese. The seeds of racism that were planted in the past were finally bearing fruit, and it took a mixture of American racism and war fears in order to finally push American society over the edge. On February 19, 1942, Franklin D. Roosevelt passed Executive Order 9066 that entailed the Army to designate military areas in which any person could be denied access. The order didn't explicitly name Japanese Americans, but unlike the German or Italian populations, the Japanese population cannot visibly pass off as being considered white, so their mass removal was inevitable. This is not to say that the German and Italians weren't imprisoned as well, but the mass imprisonment of the Japanese population was the government's prime focus. With their primary goal of clearing the west coast of individuals of Japanese ancestry, the US government needed a way to remove and imprison over 100,000 individuals. About 5,000 Japanese individuals voluntarily evacuated, but the rest waited for the military to respond. Without proper internment camps built to hold the Japanese, General DeWitt carried out the Army's part in the evacuation and decided on the use of temporary assembly centers to hold the Japanese until permanent facilities were constructed. Most of these assembly centers were just livestock exhibitions and racetracks. Some areas chosen to be assembly centers included the Santa Anita Racetrack and the Pomona Fairgrounds. These assembly centers were not fit for human life and were just a temporary housing before the inevitable move to permanent internment camps. The immense task of creating the internment camp system and its policies was given to the ill-prepared War Relocation Authority. The War Relocation Authority was created by Executive Order 9102 on March 18, 1942. President Roosevelt appointed Milton Eisenhower as the first director of the WRA. Eisenhower issued the first set of tentative policies on May 29, 1942, however they did not reach the camps until three weeks after the Japanese internees already arrived at the camps. To make matters worse, these tentative policies were not clarified and enforced until August when over half of the prisoner population had already been transferred into the internment camps. This unclear line of communications between the WRA and the local governments hosting the camps created a different experience for the Japanese Americans than what the WRA was originally planning for. According to a report of the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians titled Personal Justice Denied, Eisenhower aimed to allow Japanese Americans to still have contact with the outside world, have limited freedoms, and some allowed movement. However, the local governments argued that the WRA was going to be using the interior states as a dumping ground for dangerous individuals. The local governments did not discern the difference between culture and race. 
and came to the conclusion that because these Americans had Japanese ancestry, their loyalty was to Japan. Furthermore, some governors argued that the removed West Coast Japanese Americans shouldn't be allowed to roam their states at all, and the governor of Wyoming even went as far as to say that he wanted the Japanese evacuees to be confined in concentration camps. This hostility and confusion of presumed disloyalty by the inner states towards the Japanese Americans resulted in the camps becoming more focused on confinement and imprisonment rather than resettlement. Despite this focus on confinement, multiple different Japanese Americans who were interviewed years after their imprisonment commented that the quality of life in the relocation centers was much better than those in the initial assembly centers. An ex-evacuee of the Crystal Lake camp by the name of Dr. Izumi Taniguchi stated that the improvement to the quality of life in the camps was because of a better barrack system and a better quality of food compared to the assembly centers. This betterment of living conditions was because the internment camps were built from scratch while the Japanese American prisoners were initially imprisoned and the harsh conditions of the temporary assembly centers. The newly built relocation centers were created by the War Department and their design of all the facilities were relatively standardized. Most camps consisted of barbed wire fences, watchtowers, and armed guards around the internment camps. The camps were organized into blocks that consisted of 12 to 14 barracks, a mess hall, showers, toilets, and a recreational hall. Each room in the barrack measured at about 20 by 16 feet and was used to house one family regardless of family size. However, in 928 documented cases, two families were forced to share this same size room. Although the camps were standardized in structure, they were not equally taken care of, and some camps had worse conditions than others. A Poston High School principal recounts the observations he made of the Poston internment camp from September to December 1942. He states that the housing system of the camp was poorly planned. He stated that there was no heat or hot water provided until after Christmas of that year and that insulation was so poor that the dust storms filled the barracks. Although the relocation centers were superior to the initial assembly centers, their conditions were abysmal and provided a clear answer on the status of the Japanese Americans in U.S. society. The creation of the prison-centric relocation camp system and their policies were a result of an unwillingness to acknowledge the difference between race and culture by both the federal and the local governments of the U.S. This line of confusion and ignorance used physical characteristics as a means to define American loyalty. Furthermore, the presumed disloyalty of the Japanese Americans is reflective in both the decision to create prison-like camps and the local government's assistance in creating policies to treat the Japanese Americans as dangerous individuals. The creation of these American concentration camps is a prime example of 1940 America using race to determine not only who is loyal to the United States, but who is actually considered American. Through the examination of the formation of camp policies and the creation of the camp themselves, it is clear to see that race played a key role in the Japanese Americans' presumed disloyalty. However, despite their presumed disloyalty and mass imprisonment, the Japanese Americans revealed their true identity through their actions and words while in prison. During their internment experience, the Japanese Americans proved both implicitly and explicitly that they were actual Americans through the way they lived their lives and the actions they took within the internment camps. This emphasis on implicit and explicit actions to show their Americanness was a form of resistance that Japanese Americans used to counter the false narratives of the 1940s that declared them dangerous, disloyal foreigners. Implicitly, Japanese Americans attempted to prove their status as Americans through the way they chose to live their lives during imprisonment. Most Japanese internment camps consisted of both a free press and a semblance of a democratic body. These two institutions are pillars in American society and consist of the two things Americans have always historically fought for democracy and the freedom of speech. However, it would be disingenuous to not mention that both of these camp institutions were highly censored and regulated by the camp authorities. Nevertheless, they still stand as a significant example of the Japanese Americans' attempts of resisting their otherization. The first pillar of American society that the Japanese Americans implicitly used to prove their Americanness was the free press. The Camp Free Press was written and published by camp internees and provided a sense of normalcy for the camp prisoners and usually consisted of camp news, sports, advertisement, and most importantly, editorials. One edition of the Manzanar Free Press published on July 27, 1942 had an editorial titled Let Us Have Faith. This editorial can be described as both an implicit and explicit attempt of resistance used by the imprisoned Japanese Americans. The editorial described the evacuation as a staggering blow to the Japanese Americans' belief in democracy and it urged its readers to not lose faith in the democratic system. The editorial argued that there are still aspects of the democratic system that the prisoners could have faith in and that, quote, you can have faith in America because you have faith in yourselves as loyal Americans, unquote. The editorial also comments on the notion of unworthy Americans who consist of those Americans who are undemocratic and hurl insults towards the loyal Japanese Americans. 
Finally, the editorial ends with a bang and concludes with the statement, let us have faith and build here in Manzanar our testament to democracy, a system so perfect that other Americans may emulate it in years to come. This editorial is one of many that attempt to show the Japanese loyalty and endearment for the American system, while at the same time undermining and resisting the otherization placed upon them by 1940s American society. The second pillar that the Japanese Americans used to resist their otherization was democracy. At the beginning of internment, each camp had a block manager system to oversee the camp community. These block managers were appointed by the camp director and worked directly with administrative officers in order to keep the camp community informed and assist them with their needs. However, according to a semi-annual report of the War Relocation Authority, by the beginning of 1944, eight out of the nine camps had democratic community governments that elected their officials. These democratic governments created law codes and had a judicial commission to penalize violators. DWRA seemed impressed with the community governments and reported that they, quote, contributed to community stability and provided thousands with their first opportunity to learn and participate in the democratic process, unquote. This semblance of a democratic government is reflective of the Japanese Americans' loyalty to the American system and to their attempts to passively resist the notion that they were dangerous individuals. Creating a form of a democratic government while in prison contradicted the preconceived notions of the Japanese Americans being disloyal foreigners who hated American institutions. The Japanese Americans created a democratic government because for the Nisei, democracy is all they have ever known. The major explicit showing of loyalty Japanese Americans employed during their imprisonment was volunteering for the military. In 1943, the War Department and the WRA formulated a divisive loyalty questionnaire and administered it to the camps. This questionnaire was a part of a bigger program that aimed to both fuel more individuals into the war effort and to potentially quicken the leave-in process for Japanese Americans. Question 27 on the loyalty questionnaire asked the Japanese individual if they were willing to serve in the American Armed Forces. This allowed an avenue for Japanese Americans to explicitly prove American loyalty. President FDR supported this program and stated that, quote, America is not and never was a matter of race or ancestry. A good American is one who is loyal to this country and to our creed of liberty and democracy. Every loyal American citizen should be given the opportunity to serve this country, whether it be in the ranks of our armed forces, war production, agriculture, government service, or other work essential to the war effort, unquote. FDR further supported the War Department on their decision to create a combat team consisting of primarily Americans of Japanese ancestry. This combat team would later be known as the 442nd Regimental Team. A letter written by Mary Sukamoto to her son in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team epitomizes the significance of military service as a tool to prove loyalty. Through Mary's letter, she articulates that she believes Richard is partaking in a supreme test and a sacrifice in the ongoing fight of the Japanese Americans. She firmly believes that this sacrifice is progressing towards the struggles of interned Japanese Americans who want to be, quote, understood and appreciated by their fellow citizens, unquote. The choice by Japanese Americans to serve in the American military during their imprisonment wasn't a choice made out of patriotism. Rather, it was a desperate, explicit action taken by the Japanese Americans to resist otherization in a country they always thought of as home. Japanese American internment experience epitomizes the insider outsider dilemma. Spotlighting the internment camp life of 1940s Japanese Americans reveals a racial minority who is embedded into American culture but was still denied American liberty. Furthermore, their Americanness and American loyalty was called into question by the larger American society of the time. The internment experience is reflective of a much more important historical trend of America. During critical periods of crisis or American fear, the category of who is considered an American becomes highly restricted and excludes individuals that the American society of the time deems as invaders or aliens. Individuals who are deemed as outsiders are typically determined by arbitrary social constructs such as race. However, these critical periods of crisis in America also leaves room for resistance by the outsider group to attempt to prove their Americanness and use American institutions to contradict the false narratives of the crisis period. This duality of the insider and outsider dilemma can be characterized perfectly by the Japanese American internment experience. The creation of the internment camps and the decisions behind creating restrictive camp regulations are evidence of America excluding Japanese Americans of liberty while pushing them to the outsider group of 1940s American society. While an analysis of the implicit and explicit actions taken by the Japanese Americans during their imprisonment reveals an attempt at resisting their forced otherization through the use of American institutions such as the freedom of speech and democracy. It is within this duality of the insider-outsider dilemma that lays the significance of the Japanese-American determined experience.
The Japanese Americans were Americans all along and proved they were a part of the American system even during their imprisonment. Yet the larger 1940s American society could not discern the difference between culture and race. The Japanese American internment experience was a mixture of this confusion and blatant racism. This experience is a vital historical example of how malleable the concept of race is, and it provides an example of the real world consequences race can have on those who are deemed as being a part of the outsider race in a society.